happy Wednesday for wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thanks for joining. Pull up your favorite glass of wine or coffee or tea and get ready to dig in. If you're new here, welcome. This is where we come every single week to talk to interesting experts, founders, leaders, CEOs, and where we just took get to cut together and learn with each other. It is honestly my favorite dang meeting of the whole week, every single week. And I mean that. So thank you so much for being here. I am really excited this week because we have an amazing powerhouse founder. She's also a fellow LinkedIn learning instructor like I am and just an all around awesome human. As always, I hope you did your Google stalking before you joined. If not, no worries. We're going to include the link here so you can stalk Jenna on your own, because if you're looking for a 101 basic intro, you're not going to get it here. We're not doing the basics. We are getting in to the good stuff. We're getting into what works straight from the top. So please help me in welcoming Jenna. Hey there. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you too. Thank you for coming on. I'm so excited that you're here. Well, I'm excited to be here. So thanks for having me. I did a little bit of bragging about you before, but I will just do some more because you are doing a lot of things, lady. You have I got a lot on my plate. <laughs> you have a lot on your plate. You have your entire business. You have your LinkedIn learning courses. You have your templates and workbooks and courses that you sell off your website. You also do a podcast. I mean, you got a lot going on. I have a very full schedule, but it, keeping me busy is a good thing. I don't know if you relate to that, but <laughs> me staying busy is a good thing. <laughs> Busy is an understatement. I mean, how when you talk to people, because I'm so curious, I've noticed that through your website and through your LinkedIn, through like a lot of different channels, you always describe yourself as a career strategist. And yes. I feel like language really matters when you're talking about things because you see a lot of career coaches or right. career advisors or career teachers or recruiters or recruiter specialists. Like, what is it about strategists that you're like, that is actually what I'm doing? Yeah. So coaches in the purest form are really people who just ask a lot of questions and they help their person that they're coaching get to the bottom through questions. I do some of that. We do a lot of that actually, but then we also provide a strategy. So I think it's the, that's a huge differentiator in what we do at Recruit the Employer because I'm focused on, yes, those questions are important. And also so is the strategy to get you from point A to point B. So we can't have just the strategy and we can't have just the coaching. We've got to have both things together. So that's kind of why I landed on strategist um, because it just felt like the most natural thing. Well, and because I always think that strategy is so interesting, you know, if anybody's a big fan of history, you can look at world wars or anything like that. Right. Like sometimes armies that are the biggest and should win, they just like had bad strategies. Yeah. And I imagine yeah. it's the same. Like you could have somebody that's super talented, yes. amazing, but like they just end up in the wrong job or with the wrong salary, or they just don't have a good strategy. Jenna froze. Oh no, Jenna, you're frozen. Hmm. Strategies are fundamental. And I feel like it's one of those things that it really is true. If you have a bad strategy, it does not matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how talented you are. You are going to be in a world of hurt. Am I back? You're back. <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the strategies really, I think, make a difference because so many people don't have that experience. So many people don't really know um, how to get from point A to point B and they were taught, never taught. And so a lot of women in particular feel really guilty about not knowing how to, you know, change jobs or tell their story or sell themselves or negotiate their salary. And the reality is it's not your fault. No one taught you how to do it. So it's pretty normal that you don't have a strategy, <laughs> but now you need to get one. But now you need to get one. When when was the point in your career? Because I've, I've I've listened to your podcast and and heard you speak a bunch, and you know you really talk about how the fact that you looked at other people around you who were like Jenna, how, you know, you got all these amazing jobs within like a yeah. five year period. How did you do that? 
Mm-hmm. Was was it something that you really thought, okay, other people are telling me I'm good at this? Or did you really feel a calling like, hey, I know that careers and helping people in their careers is something that's coming from the inside of me? Yeah, I would say it's probably a combination, but the former is what launched me into it. So I had a lot of people asking me for advice and I always knew that I was entrepreneurial minded. Like even as a little girl, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. So it was pretty natural that I knew I wanted to start my own thing at one point. Um, And so for me, it was really identifying what was that thing and realizing, okay, all these people are coming to me for advice about careers. I could probably turn this into a business and that's really how it started. And then over time, I've evolved to really appreciate, learn and understand. And and I love seeing transformation when women come in and they're feeling stuck, frustrated, overwhelmed, they don't know what to do next. And then on the other side, feeling confident, encouraged, and just have clear vision and clarity around what's next. I'm curious, you know, because I I feel like in a lot of the discussions I've been having lately, it's like it's like the before times, like in the before (laughs) COVID times and then in like the after times. Yeah. You know, I feel like you must be seeing so much change so much hiring, firing, you know, Mm -hmm. changes going on. I'm curious, what were the biggest mistakes you saw people making in the before times? And like, Mm -hmm. what did that look like? And what are the biggest mistakes you see people making now? Because I I think I imagine those are different. They actually are the same. In my opinion, they're the same. And it's because people don't typically start searching until it's, they're like miserable in their jobs. or they're stuck, right? Or they're in between jobs. And so that's already too late. What you need to be doing is to always be proactively thinking about your career. And I was seeing people do that pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, I will say now the big biggest difference is there's more people right now who are going into the candidate pool, right? So not having a clear understanding of what your value proposition has always been an issue, but it's even even bigger issue now if you don't know your value proposition because there's so much more competition applying for the same jobs. And so um, I think that's the big difference between before and after. It was always important, but it's way more important now. So do you think that people just kind of ignore their value proposition or they just don't dig into it enough? I think they avoid it because it feels really scary and overwhelming. (laughs) I think it's like, okay, I'll worry about that when I have an interview. And then when it comes to the interview, they haven't thought it through or it comes out mumbled because you're not used to interviewing. Um, Or if you're networking, you really don't know what you have to offer or what you want from somebody else. And so I find that it's important to learn to know what your value proposition is at all times at all times in your career, because it's never going to hurt you to know it. So I I feel like most people fear it because it feels really overwhelming. And a lot of people um, feel uncomfortable talking about their value proposition because they feel like it's not humble. That's a big thing that I hear all the time. Oh my gosh, I'm not humble. I can't say, you know, what I'm good at because that's going to mean I'm not humble. People are going to think I'm arrogant. And usually what I say to that is if you, if you're worried about that, you probably don't have to worry about it. It's more the people who don't worry about it that I'm worried about. (laughs) I mean, when, if you had somebody who was like, okay, like I'm listening, I I know that I don't have a value proposition or I know I don't have a clear value sure. proposition. What's like one or two tips that you tell people to do to kind of get, get more clear on that? Yeah. Journaling is a powerful tool. Um, I know it sounds kind of cliche, but we walk our clients through like a worksheet to get, help them understand what is the value that you bring. So asking yourself the questions, what am I praised for at work? That's one really great way to understand what some value you can bring. And then the other thing is what results have you been able to produce for your company? Those two things together is a great starting point to start journaling through and start to really think about what have I done in my career that I've excelled at and enjoyed? That's important. And then also at the same time, what is something that people praise me for and how I've been able to produce value for a company? Those two things together is kind of your secret sauce. Well, and I feel like one of those things when you talk about the value that you bring to a company, it's sometimes for some people can be like a little esoteric, right? I feel like if you're in sales, it's very easy. You're like, I brought in $200,000 last quarter. Therefore I'm the top salesperson. But if you work in marketing or you work in another field, it's sort of like this weird amorphous, like how do I judge my value? Sure. So I think it comes down to one of three things. You're either going to make a company money, 
you're going to save a company money or you're going to make someone's life easier. It is one of those three things always goes back to one of those three things. So that's a great starting point. If you feel like I have no idea what value I even could potentially bring, start with one of those three things and start to back out after that. So um, whether you're a janitor, you are a CEO of a company, whether you're in marketing, finance, law, whatever it is, it's one of those three things, if not multiple. Well, and I feel like especially saving money is great and making money is great, but you, that's a really good point that I had never thought about. You're making somebody's life easier and how, yeah. how much is that worth to somebody? Yeah. It's so, I think it's so valuable, especially for people that are newer in their career. They're like, I don't have anything to offer. And I'm like, you are making your senior people's lives easier. If you do that well, that's really what they want to know. Like, how are you going to make my life easier? How are you going to help me reach my goals faster? And how are you going to help the company reach the goals faster? And part of that support is hugely valuable. I mean, do you find that a lot of people, by the time they get to your doorstep or mm -hmm. maybe that, that you kind of meet them where they're at, that they're feeling stuck? Oh, like, all not, the time. Common, <laughs> like stuck is are. like the most common thing, like whether it's stuck on, I don't know what I want to do next, or I don't know how to get there, or I don't know how to tell my story. I just feel stuck. That narrative is pretty normal. So if you're listening to this and you're feeling stuck, congratulations, you're a human, you're not a robot yet. And um, it's pretty normal for you to feel stuck, especially this year, I'm seeing it happen more often where you're having people that potentially got let go during you know early parts of COVID and maybe haven't found a job yet, that feels really stuck. And then there's people that have had their job, but they feel stuck at home in that job and they're miserable. <laughs> And so we're seeing a lot of those people as well start to come into the, the job searching space and to want to become a candidate as well. So I think both situations feel stuck. And yes, that's often a narrative that I hear when coming to me. I feel like one of the places that I always get stuck, one, I got stuck when I was at a corporate job and, yeah. and I actually talked about that in a newsletter that I wrote last week that I never, in, in the two and a half years that I worked at Conde Nast, I never negotiated my salary. <gasps> I never asked for a raise. Uh, also, you're killing like, me. <laughs> I was 23. I didn't even yeah. know you were supposed to do that. Like, sure. like I was not taught that. And Jeff brought up a good point and I want to touch on it, but I also yeah. read an interesting article article this last week and it talked about how in the US we're one of the only countries that doesn't negotiate or run on like any sort of like barter system. Mm. So if you ever go down to Mexico or you go to Russia or you go to any of these places, like negotiation is just like part of the way they do business. Mm -hmm. Like you go to the bodega, yeah, you're, you're negotiating for the mangoes that you're about to eat. But in the US, we're so used to Whole Foods, you know, that right. costs $5.99 and right. you know, I pay my $5.99 and I leave Whole Foods. And so I'm curious for you, like when we're talking about North America, you know, how, how do you change that mindset to, to negotiate everything? Yeah. I think part of it is realizing that money is emotional and we're probably not negotiating because we're scared, right? We're scared to, we're scared that we're going to be rejected. We're scared that there's going to be a weird result. We're just scared, right? So I think part of it is identifying money is emotional. And if we, it's not transactional, like we're trying to treat it. And so once we first acknowledge that, I think that's the first part of it. And then the second piece is really understanding what can you negotiate? So a lot of people really struggle with like, can I negotiate my salary? Um, what else can I negotiate, right? And so I agree with um, Jeff that you should be negotiating your salary. Companies expect you to go negotiate it. And if you do it well, again, I, if you do it well, that's the key. <laughs> um, they're, they're, and it's a really good company that you want to work for, right? And if the worst thing that can happen is they say, no. Now, if they're not a really great company and they try to rescind your offer, I've heard of that happening. You probably didn't want to work for them anyways. Let's first say that. And if you were kind in the way that you went about it. Um, so I think there's a fear that the, the offer will be rescinded. And I have never had that happen with any of my clients ever. I've worked with over a thousand people. And because we give them the right scripts and all of that, that makes a difference. But um, I would not be scared of negotiating because you have to do it. For, if you're not negotiating, you're missing out on so much buying power throughout the course of your career. And it compounds over time as well. And a lot of women in particular don't even realize that. Um, and I would say early in your career, it's probably a little bit harder to negotiate. And I wouldn't always recommend it for if it's your first job or second yeah. job. But I will say after that, absolutely should you be negotiating. 
I mean, because you've also been on the other side, you know, mm-hmm. you've worked at the Muse, you've, you've kind of worked in corporate and, and Wall Street, but then also obviously worked on the outside of corporate. Do you think that corporations or, or some of these bigger companies almost expect you to negotiate? Like, are, are I think they, they do. offer knowing that that's going to happen? Yes, I think that they do. And, you know, some don't, right? Some people like we gave you the top of our band is what they kind of call it, right? They Some companies have, are very structured with their process. So some corporations can't budge, but it's worth trying, right? I had a client of mine recently. Um, she um, got an offer and she they gave her an offer and it was $20,000 more than what she asked for, which is awesome. And she's like, should I even negotiate? And I said, absolutely. Let's just practice, right? You should absolutely negotiate. You probably can't negotiate salary, but you can negotiate a signing bonus or you can negotiate in her instance, a relocation package. She did $10,000 extra. It was all she did was ask, right? And so it doesn't have to be this big, scary thing. We need to normalize negotiating. I think we need to talk about money more um, so that we don't make it so emotional. But absolutely, I think companies expect you to negotiate and they leave room to negotiate. Do you guys have, and, and maybe the answer is it's it's in your program, yeah. but I'm curious when you think about, you know, Jen brings up a good point about value and negotiating and cost, mm-hmm. you know, again, especially if you're not in a sales role and it's not sure. super clear, but, you know, going in and saying, well, I think that mm-hmm. I should have $10,000 more because... Yeah, why? <laughs> I'm really great at marketing. Like, you know, like how... how how do you do that if you haven't had the job for a while? Like I can see if you've worked at a company and you're like, Hey, I'm saving you a lot of time or I'm, mm-hmm. I'm helping you out. But if it's a brand new company, like how do you yeah. know that? So I think a lot of it, we do talk about this in the program. So I'll give you kind of a briefing on it. But part of it is you got to do your own research, right? You've got to understand what does the marketplace look like for this type of role? So doing a lot of research. I mean, Google is your best friend right now, right? <laughs> Use Google. Don't overcomplicate it, right? Pay scale is another great place. And often LinkedIn, if you have the premium feature, they can give you an idea of ranges versus um, paying attention to like the title and geography. So both of those things matter when doing your research. And then the other piece of it, when we're specifically talking about value is really understanding, you've got to really know and understand what does the employer want? What does your hiring manager really want? And then catering your answer and the value that you're bringing to that. So for instance, I was making a massive career pivot from the New York Stock Exchange to the Muse. Like I never had a sales job, (laughs) y'all. Never, not even like worked at, you know, in a retail environment. And I negotiated my salary and I just, I said, you know, I'm going to be able to hit the ground running. I've talked with C-suite leaders before. You can expect this from me. I want to negotiate this. And they moved up the range because they wanted me. And so I do believe it's going to try, right? And I gave my points as to what, how I could bring value. And it doesn't always have to be quantified exactly. I think we get lost in that a little bit. Some of it can be qualitative and that's just as valuable. It's about making a case, you understanding your value and having the confident to, confidence to come forward and negotiate. And I want to touch on this point because I think it's really interesting where people, I think it was Brene Brown, you know, my fave. Brene. Yes, obviously. Everyone First loves her. <laughs> yeah. um, and she talks about leading from scars, not from wounds. So mm. like kind of been there, done that, and then you can teach on it. And I feel like that's part of your kind of secret sauce is like you did do that from Wall Street to the Muse and and you've walked the walk, therefore you talk the talk. So like tell everybody who hasn't done their Google homework, like I told them to about, (laughs) you know, the Recruit the Employer program. Yeah. So Recruit the Employer um, was a methodology that I created. um, And it's really a five-step solution to get you feeling from stuck and using that word stuck, right? Stuck and frustrated and confused about what your next move is to getting clarity, understanding, and, and being able to land your next job. So we walk through mindset, clarity, finding the job, marketing to the job, and ultimately landing the job. And how long is that program? Six months. It's a six month program. Um, and so it's really designed for women who, who want to invest the time and the effort into it. That's really the goal. Um, and so it's for those high achieving women, those overachievers. You probably were one of them. I was one of them who really want to advance in their career as well. Well, and I think, you know, Chris just hit on a good point, which it sounds like you do a lot of in your program when you're talking about a six months program and, and, you know, the first part is mindset, you know, so a important. lot of it has to do with yourself, not even really yeah. the employer or the recruiter <laughs> or the HR department or whatever. Yeah. 
Oh, 100%. And we, the mindset piece, I added that in when I realized that was a huge hang up for a lot of my clients. Um, Cause I've been doing this for a long time and you just learn over time what similar issues are for simp for people across industries. And that was the biggest thing is they were struggling with imposter syndrome. They really didn't know what they wanted. No one had really told them to think about what they wanted. They were just going through the motions. Um, I use this analogy of you can either be a bottom feeder or you can be a shark. So the bottom feeder kind of, it's really gross, but like a bottom feeder is on the bottom of the ocean and you're just kind of swimming along and hoping something comes from, you know, the top of the ocean, you're like, okay, I'm going to grab that opportunity. Okay. I might do that thing. And there's no strategy behind it where I'm, what I'm trying to do is create a bunch of great white sharks who are looking at the top of the ocean and saying, I want that opportunity. I'm going to go for that because I believe I can do it. I know that I'm capable and I know I can bring value. Not enough people think like that. They don't think of themselves as the asset. And we're really trying to reframe that. I mean, that's a huge thing. And I feel like probably so much of your work is is really spent one-on-one -on -one with clients. And I, I imagine that's why this program is so small. The cohorts are small yes. because it does take a lot of intensive work. Yes. I mean, that's why, um, so I'm Voxering. I use Voxer all the time with my clients. I have a client who's going into an interview right now. What is that? And Oh, it's a walkie. Oh, you got to get it. Um, it's a walkie talkie app basically. <laughs> so it's like voice messaging. So instead of them having my text messaging, right. My tech or my, my regular phone number and texting me all day, they're using Voxer. And so I can voice memo them things or provide some encouragement before their interview. I love it. You should, you should definitely get it. I use it with my team. Voxer like V O X E R E R. Yeah. It's an orange app. It's kind of not pretty, but <laughs> it works really, really well. <laughs> I mean, Okay, done. Yeah. And so you're, you're sending them like clandestine, like you got this. Yeah, type of I will do that because I think that matters so much. And the, we have to do the mindset work because if you don't do the mindset work, you're not going to really feel confident enough to say what is the value that you can bring. Therefore, that's going to show up in your resume, your LinkedIn profile, how you interview, how you network. And you're never going to negotiate either if you don't really believe that you deserve to be in the room. So we have to do that work first and throughout the entire program in order to actually find success for people. Well, and I love when we're talking about interviewing because D David brings up a really good point. As you're interviewing, I can remember being in corporate and all of a sudden having a lot of doctor's appointments. Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 dent like all of a sudden, like my molars are falling out. Or right, something. right. I mean, obviously, it's a little easier now that we're all working from home, but eventually, maybe in the right. after times, we, we will one day go back to the office. You know, I think David's question is good is like, how do you become that great white shark? But also yeah. a great white shark is is very noticeable compared to like a little shrimp on sure. the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. And I think it's more of the mindset piece where um, part of that comes down to the loyalty piece to your company, right? So obviously we want to be loyal. We want to exit gracefully. But at the end of the day, my dad said this quote to me and I'll share it with you. I share it all the time. But a company is only going to be as loyal to you as what makes financial sense for them. So we need to get rid of the guilt. My dad told me that early in my career. And he's right, right? We saw that all happen this year. And so, um, you know, you don't want to lie to your company, but you are total available. You can totally do it without guilt to go and entertain some options at another company. Now, the actual modality in which you do that, you could say, you know, you're going to a doctor's appointment. I do think it's a lot easier right now with COVID. I have a lot of clients interviewing and they're going to lunch or they, you know, the kids are in the, you know, whatever. <laughs> But I think it really comes down to, um, are you networking consistently? Are you making that a part of your regular routine? Routine? Are you continually updating your LinkedIn profile always so that doesn't look like it's a red flag, right? You've gotta be doing some maintenance throughout your career and too many people are waiting to like, oh gosh, I need a new job. And then everything looks obvious, right? So we've gotta be doing these things continually throughout our career, not just when we need a new job. Well, and that's true. I've definitely seen that, especially during COVID where someone's yes. LinkedIn was gathering dust yeah. and then all of a sudden it's gone through like a Beyonce <laughs> style makeover. And I'm like, mm. yes, yes. Something's going on there. Right. Um, so weird. But I will say if an employer really is paying that much attention to your profile, you've got other problems and you probably should leave. Right. Like, <laughs> let's get some boundary issues there. <laughs> I, yeah, no uh, boundaries. We could, we could go on and on, but well, it's interesting. You bring up boundaries. So your podcast yeah. new, mm -hmm. newly renamed recruiting, yes. which by yeah. the way, I love new artwork, new branding. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. 
Um, you, you blend a lot of boundaries that I think are really interesting. You know, two of the things off the bat that I think is super interesting that you talk about is one, your faith. Mm -hmm. And two, you know, back in August, you brought your, well, then boyfriend, now husband on yeah. the show, which, you know, as we talk about work-life balance, work-life blend, work-life integration, sure. you know, whatever acronym <laughs> buzzword or, of the or day you use, you know, those are two points that I think are really interesting. Like how or why did you decide to do that? Or do you think that yeah. that matters? Yeah. So for me, I think it, it looks like showing up authentically, especially when my brand was my name, it was impossible for me not to talk at the, you know, at the time and still about my faith or integrate that in somehow. Now I don't coach on faith. If people want to talk about it in, in coaching sessions, I will talk about it, but I'm never forcing that upon a client. So I want to make that clear. But for me, it's part of my story of like, um, I got out of investment banking and I really felt like God had led me to the New York Stock Exchange and then was involved in every single step of my career. So for me personally, not talking about my faith would be inauthentic. And so that was an important piece. And then talking about my husband, I have a lot of people on Instagram who loved hearing I was single for so long. I felt like forever in a day, I, like my last boyfriend before my now husband was like when I was 17 years old. So, so it was, I incorporated that because I really felt like people were super interested in it. And I felt like he had a lot of wise um, ways to look at dating. And he just totally changed my mindset around what it looks like to be a strong woman and to be married to a man that's confident enough that doesn't bother by that. Um, and that was a big issue for me. And I felt like a lot of women who were ambitious women would resonate with that. So I wanted him to come on and be like, be your ambitious self. Don't worry about it. The right man will come along if you're interested. And so, or the right person will come along if you're interested. Um, and it will all work out. So yeah, I, I'm I'm for the integration part because it helps me keep my authenticity. And just to play devil's advocate, because I feel like I've gotten this from people sure. or friends who say, well, Kim, that's easy for you because you're your own boss. So like <laughs> you can bring your whole self to work, but yeah. I work at the sure. like insert corporate company here. And like, mm -hmm. I can't do that. Like, do you get a lot of clients who are saying, I, I, I feel like I can't bring my faith or I, or I can't bring my personal life, my husband, my wife, my kids like into the workplace. Yeah. I don't get as much with the personal life. I think people want that now. They actually want to get to know their coworkers holistically. The faith one I do get a lot. We're actually doing for our hundredth episode. So in like three weeks, um, we did a whole episode on faith at work because it's, um, I think that's an important question. And I think a lot of people specifically in the Christian faith thinks, think that faith and work either means don't talk about it at all or like be a, like bring some a Bible and put it on somebody's desk. I'm like, please don't do that. <laughs> like, right? So we're either that version or that version. And so I wanted to have a conversation around it. You can just show up and talk about your life. And if it comes up, it comes up. You don't got to be weird about it. So for me, I, I, um, when I was in my interview process, somebody at the muse asked me, what do you like to do on the weekends? And I said, I'm involved in my church. Like I was just honest about it. Nobody thought it was weird. Um, they're very gracious and very inclusive and all those different things. And so I, especially in a place like New York, um, was very surprised at how much it wasn't a big deal. Um, if I didn't make it a big deal. So Right. Well, and I think the boundaries thing, especially now in the after times, yes, uh, it, they're really mushy. Yeah. Like, There's I not clear boundaries. Call, I was on a call yesterday and somebody's kids were like literally running around in the background. I was like, do you need to grab them? Yeah. <laughs> they injure themselves? And she was like, oh no, it's fine. And, but I mean, it, they're really blurred right now. Yes, they are. And I, and I think that's an important thing to notice too. Just in general, we need to be really cognizant of our own boundaries that we want to create because our companies are not going to create them for us. We've got to create them for ourselves. And so what I'm seeing a lot of, I get a lot of single women who are, and, and women that maybe don't have children yet, but women who are coming to me saying, my, my boss and my team just piles all this work on me because they know I'm single. And I was like, okay, we need to talk about some boundaries here of how that's not okay. And just because that you are single doesn't mean you have to be on 24 seven. That's not healthy for you. Um, you're not going, you need a personal life, even if you don't have a significant other in it and you don't have your own family. I think it's important that we allow people to create boundaries no matter what life stage they're at, um, because it's important for our overall health. And if we're not healthy, we're not going to show up well to work in general. What are one or two like easy boundary tips that if someone was like, okay, I know I'm not good at this, 
it's yeah. a Wednesday by Friday that they could be like implementing these one or two things. Yeah. So I would, the first thing that I would do is one thing that we call the Monday method. So every Monday blocking off time on your calendar for just you, it can be 15 minutes. It can be 30 minutes. It can be an hour and blocking it off on your calendar, already planning for it to take a rest and enjoy your Mondays. Too many people have the Sunday scaries. <laughs> Too many people are praying for TGIF. And I'm like, let's make Mondays fun. Fun, right? Let's do something fun. It can be going to, you know, if you feel comfortable going to outside eating or reading a book or listening to a podcast or going for a walk, do something fun for your Monday. So that's like a natural or, or a, a very specific type of boundary that you can make. The other thing that I would do is at the end of the week, really identifying where were your this week, like identifying where were your boundaries crossed and what are some things that you can do next week to make sure that you are blocked off by 6 p.m. so you can enjoy your night, right? Or to you know tell your boss, hey, is this okay if I don't get to this till tomorrow morning? I'll get to it ASAP, but I've got something to do tonight. Even if that something is watching Netflix, like I don't really care. Just create, start to practice it a little bit more and to set those boundaries. And you may get somebody who's mad about it, but you've got to create them for yourself. And I would say that this, this goes for not only, you know, people who are working in corporate, but people, you know, Jeff brings up a good point. If you're working for yourself or you're a contractor, sometimes the people that are the worst ones with boundaries <laughs> are yeah, ourselves. <laughs> Yes, I totally relate to that. And I think that's one of the things that my husband has helped me with a lot because <laughs> I'm one of those people who, when I was in the corporate job, I had to side hustle. So I was all, I was used to always working and then I wasn't dating anybody. So it's like, well, I'm just going to work, you know? So it was really easy to get into some bad habits. So I've kind of created some boundaries around where I sign off of my social media at 6 PM every day. I sign off for the weekend every day. So, cause for me, I'm, that's part of my work, right? It's not really fun for me anymore. It's more work. <laughs> and so that's kind of some practical things that you like have to hold yourself accountable to or get an accountability partner. We're like, you're texting the other person and saying, Hey, I'm signing off. Are you signing off? Like doing that and actually doing it, not just listening to us talking about it, actually doing it. I think those are some things that can help. And also getting your email off your phone, get it off. Doesn't need to be there. Doesn't need oh, to be there. Yeah, we can't do that. <laughs> Doesn't need to be there. Doesn't need to be there. Somebody can reach you the next day. It's not a big deal. You can get it off your phone. That Wait hasn't freed me you, up so you much. You do not have email on your phone. No, no. I, I do have it on my phone right now because I was on vacation. I was like traveling and I needed it for this actual conversation. <laughs> So I blame you, but generally speaking, no, I don't have it on my phone because I'm just always updating it. There's not, it's not necessary for most of us that are in type of a contracting. There's not like something, no emergency that's truly happening that can't wait until you get in front of your computer again. I firmly oh. believe that. Oh, oh, I'm not, I'm, I got a little chill. You're stressed. When you told me I had to delete it, I was like, me, no. <laughs> I comfy blanket. <laughs> yeah. Email, email's a huge yeah. distractor. You can't get any deep work done if you're always in your email. Yeah. The, that I get. And I've been yeah. calendar blocking, which yeah, so good. Kiss has been amazing. Yes. But you did something that, that also gives me like, uh, I, well, I'm jealous and also nervous, like with, with goosebumps, <laughs> but you, you took a sabbatical. Yes. Which yeah. By the way, in Europe and other parts of the world, people do all the time. So we're like the weirdos in America who yeah. don't do it. But like, what, why, how, what? Yeah. I mean, it's like a foreign term to most people. Yeah. So for me, um, I knew I was getting married last year. So in August, I got married. And I knew that like I probably was going to naturally have to take time off, right? You're planning for it. Even though it wasn't the wedding we wanted, it still was, we got, it was a to-do. So we went on our honeymoon, we were moving. It was so many different pieces. So I knew I was going to take at the beginning of the year when we got engaged August off. And then as COVID happened and the world started to fall apart and all those different things, I realized like, honey, I need to, I told Brent, I said, I need to take off another month. Like I really need to take off two months. And so I took off two months from work, truly two months from work. And, um, I was off of Instagram actually from July to December, completely, completely off. It was so good for my soul. Um, and I, my first month, I really just like did nothing. Like when I say I did nothing, I didn't, I read some books, but like, I did nothing productive. <laughs> 
<laughs> the product, I got married. That was it. Um, which is a big thing. But the second month I started to like go to coffee shops and then I started to think and dream a little bit about my business, but I was just, I was burnt out. Like, and I just knew that I got to a point where I wasn't enjoying what I was doing and I needed to take a break. Um, and I needed to reevaluate how I wanted to do sing some things. And I, and in that time period, I realized I needed to rebrand the company away from my name that was going to be changing anyways, <laughs> to recruit the employer, which was my system and the podcast. And that's kind of where that all burst out of was that taking that break, but it was amazing. I recommend everybody do it. <laughs> I mean, was that the first time you'd ever done it? Or yes. is this something you've done regularly? Uh, well, I did a kind okay. I attempted to do one the year before in July. Not, I didn't, it did not go well. It was like three weeks, but kind of not really anything. <laughs> I still worked the majority of the time where this time, I think I had one person who was a past client who like, she asked for some advice and I gave her some advice on something, but that was truly like all that I really did. When you came back from the sabbatical and you did go through the big rebrand, you know, moving yeah. away from your name and into recruit the employer and rebranding the podcast and the website. I mean, yeah. that's a lot of work obviously. Yeah. Was that something that you took on yourself? Do you have a team? Do you have freelancers? Do you have an assistant? Sure. Like, cause I, sometimes I look and see that and where I'm sitting, I say, well, I don't know how she did that. Yeah. That's, that's like, <laughs> sure. Sure. So, um, I got a template, a website template from my web designer who did my custom website. So a couple years ago, I, I invested in a custom website. Um, my friend, Elizabeth McCravey, she's actually a dear friend now. Um, and I bought like a zillion of her templates. My wedding website is one of her templates. She gifted me that because I was like, I hate all of these wedding websites. They're terrible. Um, and so I use one of her templates. Um, but I did all the copywriting. I did all of the, the website, um, I did have a virtual assistant at the time uh, that helped me with thinking through what is the stuff that I'm missing. But for the most part, it was really me. Um, yeah, for the most part, it was really me, but it was enjoyable. Like that was really fun for me to get to rebuild the website, to redream. Um, I love that. I think it's super fun. And the rebrand, the logistics for me is not fun. So I had a virtual assistant help me with that. Do you have somebody, when you're thinking about these big career pivots, rebranding, renaming, sure. all that stuff, I'm curious, like, do you have, does the career strategist have a career strategist? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I've had own career strategist. Yeah. Yeah. I've had plenty of business coaches that I've worked with. I don't have one currently, um, but I've worked with a lot of business coaches and strategists to help me discern, figure out how to simplify um, put together packages better. I've definitely had, I think it's important. How can I expect other people to invest in themselves if I've never invested in myself? That makes no logical sense. And so, um, it's been a huge part of my business. Um, I've been in program, a ton of programs and had a ton of coaches myself. I love that. How much time do you think you invest in, and maybe it's not coaching, maybe it's just learning, you know, mm -hmm. reading books, listening podcasts. But like, if you had to look at a, a week or, or a month, mm -hmm. even like how much time are you investing in learning? Yeah. So I would say in the height of seasons, it's probably around eight hours a week that I was like, actually like, learn. like when I think about podcasts, right, I'm like running and I'm listening to a podcast. So it's probably around eight hours. I would say now I've kind of forced myself to not to create boundaries and to listen to fun podcasts <laughs> versus business ones right now, our business is, is moving. And so I don't, I'm not as worried, quote unquote. Last year, I ingested a lot of information just because I wanted to hear what other people were doing and how they were navigating the crisis and how they were handling their clients and all those different pieces. And so at that time, I was spending a lot of time learning. But now I would say it's maybe one to two hours a week, if that, um, just because we've got a rhythm going. Right. You're like, you're in the groove, you're yeah. flowing. Yeah. There'll be a season where I'm back in, <laughs> you know, back into learning because I'm a lifelong learner. I really do. And you probably relate to that. I'm always reading interesting books. Um, I want to personal development's really interesting to me. So all of those pieces to the puzzle, I really do think make a difference. Um, but I think it's important to recognize when you're getting obsessive about it <laughs> and to take a break and to create some boundaries. So what are some of those newsletters that are hitting your inbox every week that you sort of use as like a, a tune up, if you will? Yeah. Oh gosh. You know, for me, I don't pay attention. I love your newsletter actually. <laughs> um, Andrew Seaman, he's great. He does, um, the LinkedIn 
Fired stuff is fantastic. I love reading his um, every week. And then beyond that, I've kind of like stopped, I think, as much of ingesting information right now. I'm in a season of I'm listening to true crime. Like that's my thing right now. <laughs> I, I would recommend, uh, there's an amazing podcast that I love called Dark Down East. Okay, I'm going to write it down. If you haven't heard of that one, no. I would highly recommend. Okay. It's on my Beautiful list. Beautiful, fun episodes uh, that I really enjoy. Um, why would you say to somebody who, do you recommend podcasts and newsletters to, to people that are maybe not your clients, maybe they're thinking about, you know, kind of working with you later down the road, or do you recommend more of your programs like your LinkedIn learning courses where maybe it's not as much one-on-one -on -one time with you or, yeah. you know, talk about like the different levels or the ways that people can work with you. Yeah. So, um, obviously our podcast recruit the employer, we love hearing from people. We've had a lot of people who have listened to that podcast and I just got an email yesterday. It was an awesome, I love getting those emails. So if you listen to my podcast and you, something happened in your career, please tell me it's such a gift. Um, we had somebody who said that this, she negotiated her salary because she listened to her pod, the podcast. I'm like, yes, I love helping people make money. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> Um, and I had somebody else who said it gave her the confidence to switch jobs finally after being the same one for a really long time. So I would say our, you know, recruit the employer, the podcast is a really, really great place to start to get your mindset changing. Um, our recruit the employer program is our most extensive, but we also have some one-off services where, um, we uh, do resume and LinkedIn revamp or career clarity is a big one that we offer. And then we have um, another coaching program that's, um, it is more intensive. It's for people that really want to invest, but it's like a six month booster of what recruit the employer is. It takes six, uh, sorry, it's a six week booster, six week, um, six week booster. Um, and so that one is really designed for people who want to go fast and want to figure out what's my brand. What do I bring to the table? How do I communicate that and make sure that my resume and LinkedIn look really good. Um, and we actually will be launching. The last thing is we'll be launching our um, journal. We are actually launching a career journal called the career map journal. We're super excited about it. Um, and that one will be launching May 4th. So a physical product, which I'm so excited about. <laughs> that is so exciting. That's been a learning curve for sure. I love that. I feel like the booster program is really interesting. And Jeff makes a good point because I think a lot of people are saying well, when we do get out of these weird yeah. times that we're in and we go back mm -hmm. to the new normal, you know, how are you thinking about that transition for, for your clients or, or for your future yeah. clients? Yeah. So I think the things that you need to be thinking about now is do you want to change jobs in the next year? If so, you've got to be doing the work now. You've got to be doing the mindset work. Now. You've got to start understanding what do I want? Like, that's a really great question to ask yourself. If you don't know the answer to what do I want and what do I have to offer, start thinking there. Like, that's all you need to do if you're thinking about changing jobs in the next 12 months. It's a great place to start. And then from there, you'll start to uncover and realize, oh, I need a networking strategy. Oh, I need these other pieces to the puzzle. But start there so it feels a little bit more manageable. Well, and I feel like it's one of those things that it's, you're always feeling like you're too late. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you're always yeah. like, oh, there's so much to do. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'd say give yourself some grace with that, right? Um, another thing that I talk to people about specifically with networking is um, don't just network when you need something because that's going to make you feel really awkward. And we've talked about this, I think. And it's just going to, that's why networking feels awkward because you only are networking when you need something. If you make networking a way of life, which I believe that you do, it becomes a lot easier that when you actually do need something, you have a Rolodex of people that are willing to help you because you've built a relationship with them. So I think in the same instance of asking those two questions, start to connect with people one, because people are craving connection right now, craving it. And the other part is because it's really good for your career. <laughs> Even if you're an introvert, I've seen introverts really excel on the one-on-one -on -one conversations and not in the big networking situations in a perfect time to do that. Well, I feel like also whether you're an extrovert or you're an introvert, one quality we can all have is curiosity. Yes. Like you can be Love curious. That whether or not you love people, hate people, yes. want to go out, want to stay at home, like you can be a curious human being. Yes. And so I feel like that is actually one of the main ingredients of networking is, mm -hmm. is being curious. You know, I always tell people if there's a podcast you listen to or a book you like, who is, who wrote that? Yeah. You know, or, yeah. or I have friends who have podcasts and like you said, they'll say, you know, I had a podcast, it had a thousand downloads, but not one person sent me an email. 
So they're like, I know that people are listening to it, but it's not like you're getting a thousand emails back. So what I, you know, my friend was like, yeah, to your point, when anybody writes to them, yeah, they're to like, that. oh, so, you know, that, that small thing, it makes a huge difference. And that is yeah. networking. Yeah. I had somebody actually, this is another instance of one, just a great human, but a person who listened to the podcast and she was the one who negotiated her salary. She sent me via mail, a target gift card. Like it was just like the sweet, I mean, I'm not expected at all whatsoever. And I was just like that. I will always remember that girl. Oh, if she ever needs anything, I will always remember her. Right. It just, you just, it just differentiates somebody. And so, um, I really think that it's an opportunity now to be unique with your networking and really showing people that you care and respect them and respect their time. If you do that, you're going to be memorable and you're going to be a great networker. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. And I feel like speaking of time, it is my favorite time because I am obsessed with these speed round questions. Yes. <laughs> I think I'm ready. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. Yes. I love these because I just feel like it is a, a not creepy way for me to just copy all your homework. Yeah. And Game on. do everything that you do. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. What is the best thing that you have started using lately or doing lately that yeah. you are obsessed with? You're like, I love this. Gardening. I mean, gardening on my apartment, <laughs> like outside, because here's the deal. We do things with our fingers on a keyboard. We don't really do things with our hands as much anymore. And so it's very therapeutic actually for me to repot plants and to like, to like nurture some tulips. Like it actually is very lovely for me. And I think it helps me come up with creative ideas because it's allowing my brain to rest while still doing something relatively productive. So that's what I'm doing right now is gardening. <laughs> I like that. That's very like home on the prairie. Yes. You know, Nashville did that to me a little bit. Um, I feel, <laughs> I feel more connected to uh, the earth probably than I ever did living in New York. Cause what is earth in New York? It's all concrete. So um, I've loved living in Nashville for that and just getting to be outdoors. It's one of my favorite things. So well, okay, then, then maybe this follow-up question is perfect, which is what is the best gift that you've given yourself lately or maybe done for yourself, but you can't say moving out of New York because now okay. we're ready for that. I was going to say sabbatical, but we kind of talked about that. That was probably the best thing that I really did for myself. I would say that making the commitment to launch the journal, I had been dreaming about it for so long and had thought about it. I was like, yeah, I need to do that thing. But I never actually acted on it because I think fear was holding you back. Will anyone buy it? Will people think it's stupid, right? There's a lot of those things that we go through in our brain. And so making the commitment at the end of last year and paying someone to help me with it was like the best thing that I did. I love it. And so, and by the way, is that for pre-sale? Can people? It is not pre-sale, but you can get on the wait list. So recruittheemployer.com slash wait list and you'll be okay. first to know. Done. <laughs> um, what is the next thing that you're really excited to learn? Could be like a language. I want to learn French sure. or it could be something to have to do with work. Yeah. So for me, um, I bought masterclass, I think with like the rest of the world last year during COVID. And so when my husband goes and hangs out with his buddies, I watch masterclass cause he cannot be bothered. Um, and I've been watching, um, learning about screen or screenwriting from Shonda Rhimes. She's a genius. Jean, yes. And so learning how she went through the process of how she processes through screenwriting and how she goes through her writing process, like I find so fascinating. And so for me, um, learning about that is what I'm interested in right now. I love that. And yeah. by the way, all of her shows, Grey's Anatomy, Amazing. How to Get Away with Murder, like she's the queen. She is the queen. Yeah. Scandal. I mean, I had the scandal wine goblets for forever and she inspired me at my diet for a season you know, of life. <laughs> Probably really unhealthy, but it was wonderful. <laughs> wine and popcorn. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Totally good. <laughs> uh, when you are on social media, when it's not deleted from your phone, yeah. what are some accounts or, or humans that you yeah. follow? And, and it could be Instagram. It could be LinkedIn. I know you're on LinkedIn a lot as well. Yeah. Like who do you follow that just, it just kind of lights up, or I guess it could be a brand. It doesn't have to be human, yeah. but like, what are accounts that you follow that just, they consistently are putting out stuff where you're just like, yes, that is yeah. good. 
So there's a girl on Instagram, her name's corporate Natalie, and she makes the most hilarious videos about work culture. So everyone, if you are in any work environment, you will appreciate her. She's just so funny. So I giggle every time I see her stuff. And then I would say the other person on Instagram is her name's Angie Green. And she is kind of a holistic, she's from California. Um, she went through kind of a big healing process in her life. And so she always has really cool recommendations of natural products. And I'm all into that. And so, um, I like take everything she says and I'm like, Oh, I need to try that product. She's not a person. She's like an influencer that you don't hate on, on Instagram. Right. Cause she's not like in your face about it. Like buy this bag. She's just like, here's this what I'm using with my kids. And I just love it. I love her. I love her. Angie green. I love that. Okay. As a career strategist, I feel like you and your clients kind of look in on corporate world, like corporate HR, and I'm sure there are things that you see over and over again that just drive you nuts that you're just yeah. like, why does every HR department do X or why does every company do Z? If you could have like a Harry Potter wand and you could just like change one thing that you feel like HR departments or companies are doing wrong, what would that be? Ghosting candidates, hands down, the worst thing in the world. It's terrible when you're dating. It's terrible whenever you're applying to jobs. Ghosting of candidates is so, and it happens at every stage, right? So it happens, you know, we get ghosted. I understand a little bit in the beginning, like process where you've never talked to somebody, but I see it happen a lot when they've already had an interview with somebody and they don't tell them what's up. That is so frustrating for me to watch a candidate go through the question mark of, am I moving forward? Am I not moving forward? It is not hard to have a clear process. I'm sorry. It's just not, there's too much technology around today for you to not have a clear process to let somebody know, hey, you didn't move on or hey, you are moving on. Um, so that's probably my biggest beef with companies. If, if they would fix that, it would make me a lot happier. And it makes candidates a lot happier. It's a better candidate experience. Well, and it probably also gives them a bad reputation because you know that person is going to step away from the interview process and be like, oh, you know, Bank of America sucks or, or yeah. whoever it is that they were interviewing with. Yeah. Well, I think what also happens though, the bad part about it is that they may think that, but the more likely thing that they're thinking is what's wrong with me. That's the first thought that they're actually having. And it drives me crazy because I want them to realize it's actually the company's issue, not their issue. No, a hundred percent. Oh. Yeah. Where's our Harry Potter wands and we yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Um, gosh. So, okay. What is one thing that you think that everyone should try this week? It could be like a breathing exercise, could mm -hmm. be a book. I, I will give mine, which is I think everybody should listen to an episode of Recruit the Employer <laughs> and preferably the one with you and Brent because I thought that was like really cute. Oh, so that'll be mine, but like what, what would be the homework something that you would give everybody? Yeah, I actually think the Operation Varsity Blues on um, Netflix, it's about the whole scandal with the elite, the kids getting into colleges that they shouldn't have gotten into. Oh. It's kind of interesting because it's there. They acted out with the actual scripts from the FBI, but it's also documentary style. One, I think it's a great documentary because of how it's done. But then I think also just from the perspective I wrote about it on LinkedIn of, you know, expectations around like guarantees and how, especially in the job process, when I look at a lot of, so there's some coaches out there that will guarantee somebody a job. And I was like, you need to be running away from them. Watch Operation Varsity Blues. That's why, because it's too variable. Like you can't actually guarantee somebody a job who can't guarantee a lot of things in life. And so anytime that I see that it always is alarming to me. And it was kind of like the proof is right there. So it's just a fascinating watch. And also I think it applies to the job process too. I love that. Okay. Done. <laughs> I went to my homework assignment for this weekend. Yes. Love it. <laughs> uh, if people want to keep learning from you and they want more Jenna in their life, you know, yes. what platforms are you on the most? Like where can people keep learning from you? Yeah. So where I'm uh, most often is LinkedIn. So if you go to my LinkedIn profile, I produce a ton of content. We pr produce about 10 pieces of content per week. So that's a great place. Follow us there. Um, and then on LinkedIn, we have both uh, my personal account where I talk more about life and 
more fun stuff, I guess. Um, so Jenna underscore Viviano on um, Instagram and then Recruit the Employer also has an Instagram as well, which we've got some funny, funny memes and just some really great content on there to help make mixture of great content and funny content. So I'd say those are the three places and obviously our podcast as well, Recruit the Employer. Oh, I love that. <laughs> well, Jenna, thank you so, so much for coming on and dropping so many golden nuggets of wisdom on us. Thank you for having me. It's been super fun. I love that you do this and it just feels natural and not stuffy and, and love it. So thank you for having me. We're, we're a fun group and we'd love to have you back. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm here for it. <laughs> we can talk about boundaries the whole entire time. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. All right. Well, have a wonderful rest of the week and everybody else enjoy your week. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye guys.